I, I started to, but I never actually did. But getting into that habit of buying a ton of animals and doing that sort of thing, because I, I saw that other people were doing that and were successful with them. Like, that's not me. That's not what I want to do. So I, I quickly put the brakes on it. And you could watch a lot of videos about the rule of thirds or different design techniques. And I typically don't like to talk about those things because I, I feel as though once you get into that, that box, if you will, you stay in it. And I always say, don't scape. Don't think about scaping. Just shut your brain off and listen to what the materials are telling you. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. This is episode number 85. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you very much for tuning in today. If you are looking for more information on the show, make sure you head to Animals at Home network.com there you will find show notes as well as information for all the episodes that have been produced if you are interested in an animals at home t-shirt head to animals at home.ca slash shop five dollars for every t-shirt and sweater does automatically get donated to the amazon rainforest conservancy and if you would like early access to episodes as well as the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests you can join us on patreon at patreon.com slash animals at home and thank you very much to our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. There are affiliate links in both the YouTube description as well as the show notes. So if you are in the market for any new reptile equipment, I highly encourage you to go check them out because if you do make a purchase, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that helps support the show. All right, let's jump into today's episode. I basically do not need to introduce today's guest because today I'm speaking with Tanner Serpa from Serpa Design. Everybody is familiar with this channel. Tanner's channel really does, and I talked to him about this in the podcast, it sort of seems like it's been ever present and it also seems like a primary source. Whenever we're looking, or at least me personally, and I know many of you as well, whenever you're looking for DIY information or bioactivity information or planting, whatever it is, when you type that in on YouTube, it's his videos that come up first. So I'm pretty sure he is a mentor for many of us in the hobby. So it was an absolute pleasure to have him on the show. In the episode, we really focus on the art of keeping and how to use herpticulture as a creative outlet. So Tanner walks us through some of the main mistakes he sees people make with vivariums, you know, how to make them look better and more dramatic. He tells us all about how he got into all of this in the first place. How did he get into animal care as well as vivarium and terrarium building? And we also discussed something that I've brought up on the podcast before that I think Tanner executes almost perfectly, and that is designing the entire room and, and creating some beauty within the entire reptile room or animal room, rather than just focusing on one enclosure at a time and just kind of wedging enclosures into a room where they fit, you know, having this holistic view of how you want the entire room to look so that when somebody walks into your room, they're sort of confronted with a beautiful scape of enclosures rather than just individual enclosures and so i think tanner like i said he, he executes that perfectly and he has some tips on how to do that as well so let's just jump into this episode i will talk to you guys once we're wrapped up enjoy well tanner welcome to the show thank you so much for doing this of course of course i'm i'm actually uh i've been throwing around the idea of starting my own podcast so i'm trying to get my feet wet and i'm you know just going around see what i could do awesome well i mean I would love to, for you to start a podcast. So if you do, I will definitely be listening to it. And like I said to you in DMs, you are definitely one of the most recommended people quite often in the comments, you know, get Tanner on Serpa Design. And you probably don't know this, but originally before this podcast even started, you were one of the original people I contacted to come on the show. Really? Uh, but it, this is like before the show even started. So, you know, this is episode number 85. So I'm much happier to have you on now when the show's established and you've grown so much since then as well. So I'm sure. The thing about your channel is it, it definitely seems like it's ever present. You've been on YouTube. For some reason, it just seems like you've been around forever. So I would love to hear a little bit about your history, not just with starting YouTube, but bring it back to what got you into what you're doing. How did you get into animal care, plant care, and, and terrariums? Where did that start? Yeah, so I mean, I think like a lot of people around my age growing up, Steve Irwin was really present and uh, Jeff Corwin and... Uh, you know, all those animal shows that were on back then. And my brother and I were both really young and we saw those shows and we grew up in areas that were always in close proximity to good nature. And so we'd always go outside and pick up rocks and look at salamanders, crayfish, all that kind of stuff. And uh, eventually it got to the point where we started keeping animals. And the first animal that we were really successful with were American toads. And so we uh, took them from outside, which I mean, nowadays it's like you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it, it's tough because whenever kids are real young, that's the age whenever I feel like this stuff can really stick in. Mm -hmm. So it's like you want to deter kids from doing that. But at the same time, it 
it's like a double-edged sword. I think so many of us did it. So many of us did yeah. that. And it was a huge part of our learning. Like, I totally agree with what you're saying there. Yeah, and I mean, we kept them for eight years. You know, they lived fairly long, and they were full, full-size full adult toads when we got them, so who knows how old they were to begin with. But, I mean, we weren't always successful, but I would say it kind of started there. And um, so there was always just an interest in amphibians especially, which if, if you go through my collection, it's primarily frogs and stuff like that. And so we were keeping them, and uh, I... I was probably like five. And so since that age, I've always had animals, but I was never really keeping them in the type of enclosures with live plants and doing the whole bioactive thing really until maybe like 12, 14 years ago, something, something around that time. And, uh, it just, I guess it snowballed from, I'm keeping the animals for so long and I'm really enjoying it. But eventually I was thinking to myself, I could do better keeping them in, 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 in environments that are actually similar to where they're coming from in nature. Be, and it all changed a lot whenever the internet started coming out. Because like you said, when we started, we were young, so we weren't really reading books. Mm-hmm. And the internet wasn't a thing. And the people on those TV shows, they're not showing you how to set up enclosures and stuff like that. So it just got to the point where I'd, I'd do research on things. And I would say that my hobby is largely just anecdotal, just from experience doing things, finding out what works. And um, yeah, so I, I guess it just went hand in hand. So as soon as I started trying to make better enclosures for my animals, I was like, got into the plants thing. And I always liked plants. And actually when, I think it was in kindergarten or first grade, something, uh, early on in school we went on a field trip to some uh conservant conservatory and they gave us uh, a sensitive plant and dude i loved it i thought it was the coolest thing ever i would touch it and the leaves would close up and uh so i always had like a draw to plants but i never really kept anything and so it i guess the hobbies just kind of melded together and uh here we are now (laughs) yeah well it is i I totally can relate to that experience as being young and trying to replicate these environments as best as you can and and i definitely kept frogs and even random things like mice and moles and i remember going on youtube and like we had a pool where i grew up so we're constantly finding things in the pool in the morning running on the tarp so you know you catch them and Google was, you know, you could find like, you know, the color of the mole or the color of the mouse and, th- and whatnot on, on YouTube or on Google, but you weren't going to find any more sort of care information. So then wh- what did you, how, what motivated you to start YouTube? Okay. So my channel, well, I've been on YouTube since whenever the platform first came out. I was probably like 13 or 14 and I, I wasn't doing animal videos, really just goofy, goofy videos with my friends or whatever. And, uh, but I was always keeping animals, so eventually it got to the point where I was making videos of my animals, but it wasn't like what I'm doing today. It was just, oh, I'll, I'll feed my bullfrog a mouse or, or something like that. And that was still really early on in YouTube, maybe like 2005 or you know, 2007, something like that. And eventually I, I just kind of stopped posting. or whatever. I wasn't even posting regularly. It's just if I had something to post, I would. And then uh, when I was going to school, I went to school for graphic design. I started a YouTube channel, and I was essentially just going to do it for painting time lapses and stuff. So I I have an artistic background, so I was just going to do stuff with art. And then um, I thought one day, oh, you know what? Why don't I make a terrarium video just to do it, have, have some fun with it? And I posted it, and then I didn't do anything else on the channel for probably about four or five years. And so then I was like, thinking to myself, I should start that terrarium series up again. And I posted it and it got maybe like 10,000 views in a week or so. And I'm like, maybe I could actually do something with this. So then I started making more content and posting things. Cause it's like everything that you see me do on my channel, I was doing all of that before I was on YouTube. So it's ca- kind of like the whole thing of the channel is, um, obviously it comes from sort of an educational perspective perspective but i'm basically just showing you what i what i do like what what my hobby is so i would say that really just kind of came came out of a interest for me to share what i'm doing with other people and then eventually it snowballed into what it is today well and it's interesting i think you hit like a perfect time for the niche of your channel because there was this movement totally outside of animal and reptile care and amphibian care of just 
you know, average people in their homes wanting to recreate ter- terrariums. Like, I don't know where that yeah. came from. It was like a Pinterest thing. And your channel was there to the scoop up all these people that were just, you know, hey, I want to make a, a small little plant vivarium. And it, yeah. just, it just coupled with that so well. It's, it's, I'm not really sure where that came from, but it just happened. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know either. And honestly, I wasn't aware of it when I started posting. I just did it because it was something I liked doing. And then I'm like, man, this is kind of crazy. So the, the terrarium certainly kind of jump started everything. But I, I would say that I'm, even though my channel is not, I'm a more animal centric person as far as my hobby is concerned. Mm-hmm. So, and it's interesting that you say that because even when I watch you build things and I watch you work on enclosures, I don't get the sense that it's animal centric. Not not to say that you don't care about the animals, but you have yeah. this very holistic herpetoculture approach when it comes to building something where that's one of the areas of the hobby that I really don't like is that everything is so animal centric. It's like, here's my animal on my hand. And then we don't even look at the enclosures that they're in or the setup. Yeah. They're in. And the animal for you is a, a very, it's a piece of it, but this whole process is, is, you know, what the hobby is meant to be in my opinion. And, and that's the sense yeah. that I get. Is that the way you feel when you're doing it? So, yeah, I mean, so it's, I, I guess I say that it's animal centric in that I, I like the animals more than I like the enclosures themselves mm-hmm. and I'm not afraid to tear down an enclosure if I make something that I think is better for the animal. I, I don't have as much of an attachment to them as I do the animals. Mm-hmm. Like I'm attached to the animals almost immediately, which for me is honestly the worst part of the hobby. I'll get attached to something in a couple of weeks. Most of my animals live for 10 plus years and then they pass away and it's like I think to myself, do I even want to keep doing this? Mm-hmm. I can't deal with this heartache. But then I think to myself, you know, they bring you so much joy in the time that you have that it's it's worth it. But um, I, I guess for me, I tend to think that if you put your if you put the enclosure build first, you're putting the animal first. Mm-hmm. So uh, if if you take the time to do a setup that's really not overly elaborate, but elaborate to the point that the animal is going to be able to use everything. And I tend to think that probably your third or fourth iteration of an enclosure for an animal you have is probably going to be the best because all the animals I have, they're not in their original homes because I've observed them. I've seen what they use, what they, you know, how they behave. And so I've built the enclosures around their habits. So I think that if you do that, you're going to put the animal first. Well, and that's what I really love about your channel as well is even though I think you do explicitly say it, but you don't even have to because you can tell that what you do every day is practice building enclosures. Like you've made hundreds of enclosures and vivariums and it's just (laughs) constantly getting better. So it's like you watch Tanner do something and it's this amazing enclosure, but it's like the 500th time you've been tinkering with that idea. And I think it's a really good point is that when you set up an enclosure for the animal, maybe you'll get a year or two out of it, but then you learn from the animal, okay, this idea, that was stupid. I got to get rid of that. I thought it was cool. He doesn't use it or they use this section. And so that is that learning process and that that's why you can tinker with a setup forever and you don't feel the need to constantly be getting new animals because you have this unlimited project sitting in front of you all the time yeah of course and i mean there's i definitely uh i definitely like getting new animals everybody does and of course i think i know that a lot of people they'll get scared as in thinking oh you have all these animals how can you take care of them i think that if you build up a collection very slowly and it ends up becoming large over time it's not a problem because you really can dial in the care for each animal to the point to where it doesn't take you very long because you're proficient with it Mm -hmm. and so if anybody wants to get to the point where i don't even think i have that big of a collection but if they get one like mine or yours or anyone else as long as you do it slowly and you learn your animals it's not going to be that big, that much of a burden for you. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. So then kind of getting back to what I was saying earlier, where it does seem like your channel has been around forever. You are, I think for many people, a primary source when it comes to information on how to do a lot of DIY projects, how to build vivariums, you know, your key, your keywords pop up right away. If you search any of those things, it's all you. Yeah. Where did you learn this stuff from? Is it mostly just tinkering yourself or is it just a bunch of different areas? Yeah. So like, I would say that a, a large portion of it is from tinkering and doing things like that. So I've I've tried probably just about every type of background you could in a very using different materials and I've kind of learned what works for this type of setup and what's not ideal for that type of setup. Uh, I would say that a lot of it also is just from going on forums and things like that when I was really young. And so that, that stuff's been, it's been around for so long, a lot of the things that I do that you can't really 
pinpoint a source. It's like, uh, you know, like the dry lock backgrounds, you could say, oh, Troy, Bo Troy Goldberg, he, he kind of uh, established that in the hobby. But some of these other things, they've been around for so long that you can't really say, oh, this guy did it or that guy did it. So I, I would say a lot of it is just tried and true methods combined with my own experimentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is really the key is just being able to constantly practice. And I mean... So at what point did YouTube become a, th uh, a project where you realized this could maybe become a, a full-time income? Uh, you know, I, I guess it was really as I saw that the audience was coming in and they were interested in what I was doing and that people, I could tell that people were interested in what, what I was doing, not only for the projects, but they were also becoming invested in me mm -hmm. and kind of my personality and how I portrayed things on the channel. And I actually didn't even monetize my channel till I had 40,000 subscribers. And to some extent, I almost felt guilty about it because mm -hmm. I was like, I shouldn't be making money just to, to share what I like doing. But in reality, that's what I, as a kid, I always wanted to do something with animals and art. And that's really what I wanted to do for a living. I just didn't know what that looked like. And you know, obviously you see what it is today. That That is what it looks like, at least right now. And I would say that it just kind of happened uh, naturally. It wasn't my original intent to, to make a living out of it. But once I saw that it was possible through building an audience, I was like, maybe I should try to take this seriously. Yeah. You're not the first person I've heard that has a a passion on YouTube and they are not monetized and then they feel guilty about potentially monetizing it where you have like the random dude next door who has a thousand ads in a four minute movie yeah. or a four minute video and he's just a horrible video with no content and you're like okay maybe if they can do it I should probably be doing it as well and yeah. really it's one way you can get paid for the amount of time that you put into all this yeah yeah I think nowadays I don't feel guilty about it at all because I do like you said I always try to put out quality content in that I know if somebody's watching my content, it's in most cases they can learn something from it or at the very least it's high quality entertainment because mm -hmm. I always edit the videos down really well and take my time to just do things to where it, I think from a viewer's perspective of is this something that I would watch and I do watch some stuff that's lower quality but I prefer once you get to a certain point where you have all these subscribers and what I tend to think you should probably be upping your your game as far as editing and stuff's concerned because i i value i value the viewer's time so i feel like you should be receiving a quality product if that makes sense yeah i think yeah i think the obligation does go up to continue producing better content and the sort of theme of your channel or even just like the the fonts that you use and the graphic design that's all been pretty consistent i guess that was because you have that background and you started that a few years ago and it just seems like it fits your channel so well you've not had to tinker with it like you nailed it at the beginning and even yeah. the style you do like narrating doing the voiceovers and whatnot you haven't changed that too much obviously the quality and the the builds get better but the yeah. actual framework is very similar so, yeah, I mean, if, if you go back to my original content, if you were to watch every video, you would see a gradual shift in how I do things. But I do it very slowly over time so that if people get attached to a certain way that I'm doing videos, it happens very slowly to where they don't even notice really that it has changed until one day they go back and watch an older video and they're like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is way different. So... And my channel wasn't even originally supposed to be those scripted videos. The only reason that I went down that sort of rabbit hole, if you will, was I wanted to try to explain the most information as cohesively as possible in the shortest um, like package that mm -hmm. I possibly could. And it, it just kind of went hand in hand with that. But it's also nice because it's easy for me to film in that way because I just have it on tripods and do that sort of thing. Whereas if I'm trying to do a vlog video and I'm like, oh, yeah, and... I, I, f I get, find it annoying if I watch a video and somebody's like, oh, and I'm going to put the tank together with the silicone. And, and so they explain everything yes. and then they show it again. It's like, well, why don't you just overlay some B-roll as you were explaining that so it's not redundant? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I learned that as well. Like I've done a few DIY videos where it's like, yeah, you sit in front of the camera and explain everything you're going to do and then you do it. And it's like, okay, let's <laughs> yeah. just cross out. You sort of do yeah. it twice at that point. Just um, do it. So... You, but you also have, you know, a video every week. You put out a video every Saturday. How the hell are you coming up with that much content? Because it's not like your videos are simple. Yeah, yeah. So 
I've been doing the Saturday video every day for the past three years, I would say. So it's not been the whole time that I've been consistent on YouTube, which was about five years. Uh, and I only took one day off or one week off rather from posting, which was a couple months back. But I've done it, you know, every month since. And uh, I would say that really it just comes from it's something inside it's just the way that I, just the way that i am like in in my being i ha i have a necessity to make things and i guess you could call it an obsession but it just helps me to to keep myself in a good place by making things mm -hmm. if if that makes sense it just helps me I, I don't want to make it sound like i'm mentally unstable but but it it keeps me sane like making things it it keeps me in a good state of mind and it it's like uh how some some people they're like oh I, I need to go running or uh, I need to work some way to get that energy out and so yeah. for me it's making things and so I, I guess making the videos it's what I would be doing anyway so yeah. maybe not making not making or filming a video about it per se but actually making the projects and doing things and that's how it's been my entire life I just got to tinker with stuff or when I was a kid I was building Legos so mm -hmm. it's really just a something in my being that I need to make stuff. <laughs> well, I, I, I totally hear what you're saying. And I think that that creative or the creative spark is in everybody and everybody, it sort of manifests in people's lives in different ways. So some people, yeah, maybe some people go and do exercise and they run and some people work on cars or have a yeah, hobby, yeah. dungeon and dragons, it doesn't matter. And to me, that's what I see the hobby as, is an outlet for people to be creative. And I think that's what yeah. you're sort of alluding to is you gain so much purpose with your life if you can do those things. And if you can't, then yeah. it's sort of a hole. And th that's where I, I love to tilt people towards the sort of advancing care because it's just uh, unfurls a whole bunch of options for somebody to dig into that creativity and that purpose mindset rather than, you know, end up getting stressed by having too many animals with low quality care. And I think many people are in the hobby and they don't realize that they're using it as that creative outlet. And I guess as a, as an artist, maybe you harness that a little bit or are aware of that a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. So I, I love painting. I like doing all that kind of stuff. But for me, I've always had to draw to nature, as I kind of explained earlier. And so for me, making a nice aquascape or a beautiful planted vivarium or something like that, that to me is better art because it's it's not like a painting where you paint it, it's done, you never have to touch it again. If you do a planted tank, you got to trim it. you got to do one. And so you're always a part of it. Whereas once you do a, a static piece of artwork, it's done. You're not doing anything else with it ever again. And so I guess for me, it's I, I like the living art aspect of it. And I also like pushing the boundaries. Like what, not, not as much with the animals, but when I do some of the terrariums, it's like, can I make something that's upside down? Could I turn my computer desk into a terrarium? Could I do this? So it's just kind of like exploring new ideas and uh it just, I don't know. I, I like learning. I like experimenting with things and not everything I do is, um, successful. I mean, that's to be expected, especially when you're doing some wacky experimental <laughs> stuff, but yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know. I, it's just, I, I really agree with what you're saying. It's just like, if, if you have something to focus your energy on, that's positive, like building enclosures or advancing care and that sort of thing. I think it's just very enriching to the, mm -hmm. to the person. And yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to become a YouTube channel or something like no. that. I know a lot of people see it and they think it's glamorous and stuff. And there are awesome aspects to it, but it's a lot of sacrifice and stuff. And I definitely don't think it's for everybody. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, I always say when you fall into those, when you're doing something with your hands or something creative and time disappears, that's when you know you're doing something that you enjoy where it's just like yeah. you, know, you, you lose the whole afternoon and you didn't eat or check your phone and you're just focusing <laughs> yeah. on something. Like those are the best times. Do you... Do you enjoy? Do you get the same creative spark out of editing, or is editing more of a kind of a pain for you? Well, so I have a love hate relationship with it. I I like. I don't like when I start. I'm like, you don't even know how to edit. What are you doing? You're <laughs> this video is gonna be crap. You don't even know what you're doing. And then once I'm about you know one quarter of the way through the video, I'm like, all right, yeah, this is this is gonna be nice. And I, I like experimenting with new things. So the problem is I've got a lot better at editing and more proficient in stuff that I did before. But as I try to do new things and try to up my editing, it never gets any faster because I'm, all, I'm always trying new things, you know. So I don't know. I, I definitely do enjoy it to some extent, but it's probably my least favorite part of the thing aside from writing and recording the script.
Yeah. Yeah. I, I know how you feel when you first start with all the raw footage and just the raw audio and everything. You're like, Oh God, here we go. You just like (laughs) throw it all in the timeline. You're like, this is going to take forever. But yeah, eventually you get onto a roll and you can, when you start seeing it come into a, it's video, then you feel, you know, excited about it. So there's another strange thing about you and and your channel is that it somehow sits outside of, and I don't know about the aquarium hobby, but it seems like it sits outside the reptile hobby in a way where you don't, you, you don't get attacked as if you're part of the reptile hobby, even though you have yeah. some of the best reptile content out there. Everybody recommends you from the reptile side. What are the best sure. channels? Serpa Design. But you don't, it, it's, I don't even know exactly what I'm trying to put my finger on here, but you feel, <laughs> it feels separated. Do you feel that? Yeah. So I was, uh, I did a podcast with the King of DIY mm. um, last Joey, week. Yeah. And yeah. I was talking to him about this because he was like, so what, what do you consider your channel? And I think the thing is, is that, I don't consider myself a reptile channel or a fish channel or a vivarium channel or even a terrarium channel. I think it's just a hobby channel. I'm literally just sharing my hobbies and to whatever extent that may be with the world. And I don't, I know that my videos are educational and I'm sure that some people think that this is what I'm doing, but I'm not propping myself up as though I'm some expert of these things. I'm just literally explaining to you what I did to make this setup and I'm trying to make it as uh, accessible for for as many people as possible. So I try to explain things easily and I try not to use these big words and I don't come at it from a um, elitist perspective if, if you will where it's like if you're not doing it like me you're not caring for your animals well and I don't I tend not to think that anything I'm doing is the correct way per se and I, I try not to per- portray it that way on the channel so I guess it's just because I'm coming at it from that perspective where it's just that this is what I'm doing and this is how I did it. And I'm not ever expressly saying like, this is how you should do it. This is the right way. So I, I guess if I had to put a, you know, put my finger on it, that would be what it is. Yeah. I think that's probably what you're probably right. It's not, you're not putting out anything in written in, in concrete or written in stone and you, you're sort of the premise of your videos is almost, yeah, like you're saying, it's a, a part of your journey and this is where you are now and this is where, and we've seen it grow over the last three or four years of your, you know, your talent evolving. So yeah, it, it must be that because people do get torn up when they try to come out with like, this is exactly how you have to do it. And then that's what yeah. creates these divisions. And yeah, I've never seen a video of yours on Facebook get attacked by, you know, people there and, you know, things like that. So it, it, sure. is, it, it, it is interesting that way. Well, yeah. And something that I've told, um, I think I was talking about it on my second channel because people ask, I I forget what was asked of me specifically, but I said that I tend to shy away from people who prop themselves up or say that they're experts at what they're doing. Because I'm like, at the end of the day, we're all still figuring this out. And I think with, with fish keeping, it's a little bit more advanced than reptiles just because aquascaping and stuff like that's been around for so long. But I think we're finally getting to the point where, you know, for so long, reptiles were perceived as dumb, stupid animals. And I think, and I've always thought that they were intelligent, but it's like people are starting to wake up to the fact that, man, probably all animals have some type of intelligence. And it's just, I I guess with new information, people are becoming more aware of what, what could be going on inside the four walls of your tank. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that I think you nail really well is and I don't know if this is something that's just developed over time, but you seem to have a very good vision for the entire room. And yeah. I always talk about that is like having a good goal for your animal room or whatever it is you're keeping. It's not, so you're not just throwing stuff in and then, you know, you have this a path that you're traveling down. Yeah. And so you take it to another level because everything looks cohesive with like sure. the stain and everything. So is that something that you've just developed over time or was that a goal? Yeah. So if, if you go back to, I don't know, maybe four years ago or whatever, the, the direction that the channel was going was a little bit different. I suppose that I was kind of getting in. I, I started to, but I never actually did. But getting into that habit of buying a ton of animals and doing that sort of thing, because I, I saw that other people were doing that and were successful. But I'm like, that's not me. That's not what I want to do. So I, I quickly put the brakes on it. And at that point, I was just making like uh two by four racks and they were painted black just real standard you know just utilitarian if you will but since as you said i come from a design background i i quickly realized you know i want this room to be sort of a 
like a destination, if you will. Obviously, people aren't coming to my house, but you look <laughs> at this and you see, wow, that that looks like something that that could be in a zoo. Or mm-hmm. so, so really, I guess from it's probably for like selfish reasons to some extent, but I really just want to show people what's possible if if you follow your dreams and you with purpose. So yeah. I. I just want people like if I take a picture of this and somebody sees it, it's like man that looks crazy this dude must be a millionaire which isn't the case not even you, you know like they they see it and the work speaks for itself they don't yeah. need to know that Serpa Design did it or whatever they just see it and they're like man that looks professional yeah <laughs> I, I I know it's like a roundabout way of answering it but <laughs> no. I feel like uh, yeah no that no that I think that's so right because you know, the individual enclosures are amazing, but then the entire room itself has a, a sense of beauty about it, which only works with all the enclosures together. And so that it yeah. does make sense that that's sort of what you kind of go so, after. And So, yeah, something else I, I think about is whenever people who aren't into these hobbies come to my house, I, I don't want them to think, oh, this is some stinky basement that yes. smells like gross and there's all these bins with just animals thrown in them. I want them to come here and be like, Man, this is crazy. This is legit. Like you're not some weird guy just, eh, like <laughs> you know, like the yeah. the uh, stereotypical like reptile guy, which isn't even you know, it's not even it's so far from the truth. But you know that I'm just a regular guy and uh, I'm doing things at a a different level than what people typically perceive. Exactly. That, that's a point that I I always mention that you know, you want the public, the general public to come in and for it to almost speak for itself while you keep these animals and for, you know, for to go, wow, that is amazing. Not to just, we don't want them to allow, you don't want the main public or the the general public to just come up with their own reasons why someone might keep 30 snakes in their basement because that, you know, you you leave that unattended, it's only going to create the caricature that you've just, you've just established, right? The creepy reptile guy with a bunch of rats and snakes and, and that's not the image we want to portray. And if you can portray the image that you have in your room, there's no way that anyone would look into that and go, wow, this is, these animals aren't well taken care of. It's, (laughs) that's the image we want. Yeah, of course. And so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't put that burden on myself to where I I consider myself an ambassador for the hobby or anything like that. I just try to um, put my best foot forward and do the best I can and just you know show show people what what could happen if if you truly respect your animals and give them love. And I mean I I'm not perfect. I don't do everything correct. I'm sure a lot of the time, but I'm I'm still learning. Everybody always is. Yeah. Exactly. Well, let's talk a little bit about actual, actually designing vivariums. We don't have to go into crazy detail because obviously you have hundreds of hours on YouTube with that. But one yeah. of the things that I think stands out so well with your enclosures is how much drama or how dramatic the the actual scapes are. So are there yeah. some tips that people can, can implement that give their enclosures more drama? Yeah, yeah. So you could watch a lot of videos about the role of thirds or different design techniques. And I typically don't like to talk about those things. Cause I, I feel as though once you get into that, that box, if you will, you stay in it. And so you'll get creative to a sense, but all of your scapes will sort of start looking the same. Mm-hmm. And in your head, you'll be thinking, Oh, does this follow the rule of thirds or what? And so it, you want to become intuitive with it. I is what I'm trying to say. So for me, it starts with looking at the materials, you know, you turn the rocks around and I have a whole channel on my video about scaping, which I'd recommend watching. Cause I talk about a lot of this stuff, but look at the materials. And I always say, don't scape, don't think about scaping, just shut your brain off and listen to what the materials are telling you. So this sticks going this way. So when you put that stick in, follow the directions of that with the other pieces that you place. So, so it looks like something from nature, you know, trees will tend to grow in the same direction because of the light or all, you know, all the branches are going in the same direction and kind of look at the textures on the materials and try to keep things looking cohesive. So if you have a rock with a ton of stratified lines on it, try to keep those going in a similar direction. Cause if you have one going this way, one going this way, one going this way. And the same goes with sticks. If you have all these X's and different things, like you typically don't see that. Sure, a tree may fall like this, you know, on a Y, and it will have that, but you typically don't see it. So I would say that it starts with listening to the materials, and then think of your enclosure as planes, if you will, or, or different. Think of it dimensionally and not flat. You'll see when a lot of people are starting out their enclosures, just flat substrate, 
and a, a couple of sticks just kind of placed wherever. You're just describing my vivarium. <laughs> well, I mean, you gotta you gotta start somewhere. I, I haven't seen you know a whole ton of pictures of them but no so, but, I, but that's exactly what, what most people do it's exactly yeah. that yeah and and so you got to start somewhere so i get it and uh people from my perspective who are advanced you got to be nice to people when they're setting up stuff and it's not at your level you started there too so you could say hey maybe do this and, and don't just like give them a list of all this stuff that they could do to to be at your level because it kind of you know P- pushes them back and it makes you seem elitist or yeah. whatever but back to the discussion so you'll see it too when people start incorporating the backgrounds they'll have sticks or elements like that included but they're all stuck to the background and there's nothing in the front of the enclosure it's all it's all on the back and the bottom and they're still flat so i would say really think about building depth like you you'll have sticks in the front you have sticks in the midground. You have sticks in the background, and then on the ground, maybe you have a, a part that's twelve inches from the bottom of the tank. Then you have another area that's right at the bottom. So really trying to build levels. And so think of think of the the ground layer. You have, and this is just like a rule of thumb. You could do three different tiers. You have like the low layer, the mid layer, and the high layer, and you sort of build off of those. And then same with the depth of the tank. You have sticks in the front, sticks in the middle, mm-hmm. sticks in the back. I, I know it's kind of a weird way of describing it, but it, it just think of it three-dimensionally and not flat. Yeah. Well, no, I think I, I, I can see that because that's one of the areas that I think many people make mistakes is is they don't utilize the space. And I think exactly yeah. what you're saying, they just have a few sticks and then sort of the middle column is just air that the animal can't even access. So you, yeah. you, it might as well not even have it in, in a sense. And there's just so much more space you can utilize if you set things up properly. Right. And I, I think you definitely see a push where a lot of people are saying, uh, get bigger enclosures now. People are starting to up the minimum tank size or mm-hmm. whatever. But I feel like you got to take all of it with a grain of salt because maybe if you have a, a crested gecko in an 18, 18 by 18 by 18, which I tend to think is maybe slightly too small, but that's like a lot of people would think that's ideal. If you have it set up to where you have all that depth to it, that's a lot of tank for them to use. They're going to be climbing on stuff, going all around. So for them, that might feel like a bigger enclosure than if it was a bigger enclosure and it wasn't set up with all that depth. Like maybe you just had a stick on the back Mm -hmm. and stuff on the bottom. So I feel like you could get, and I, I, um, I always tell people go as big as you possibly can, but if, for whatever reason, you can't get a super big enclosure. If you set it up a little bit more dynamically, you're going to utilize the space better. So like a bearded dragon, for example, if you had them in a, a 40 breeder, which is pretty, you know, that's very small, but I know some people keep them in tanks that size. If you would set it up to where there's tiers and they can climb up to the top and it, you could almost get two enclosures out of it, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So you have like a, an upper layer that they can hang out on and a bottom layer. So utilize the space smartly. Yeah. And what about lighting? Do you do anything special with lights to make it look more dramatic or is it just the way it looks after you've done all that scaping work? Yeah. So yeah, like placing things to where they create shadows and different things like that. So yeah, no, I, I don't really do anything too crazy with lighting. Is there any other common mistakes that you see? Like you've mentioned a bunch of them, but but any other ones that you notice where a keeper will post and you think, oh, there's so many things you could have done differently? Or is it mainly just the sort of the scape, not utilizing space? Yeah, I would say the number one is not utilizing the space as ideally as possible and also placing items to where it looks unnatural. So kind of what I described earlier, mm-hmm. sort of following the, the look and feel of the pieces that you're using. But I would say aside from those things, it's probably just using materials that aren't really ideal for what you're wanting to achieve. So... Um, using driftwood that's going to decompose really quickly in a tropical environment or uh, using plants that are way too big for a small enclosure or vice versa. I mean, Mm -hmm. you'll see me do it sometimes, but I'm constantly pruning the plants and and keeping them to a manageable size to where, so even if it is a giant plant, I'm keeping it kind of like a a bonsai, you know, I'm trimming it down to to keep it compact. So I'd say it's probably those three things. Well, and one other thing I see you do consistent, consistently is uh, slope the, the substrate. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so I mean, if at the very least, that's that's probably the easiest way to create depth in a setup. So you'll cr create almost those planes or the levels that I was describing earlier just by putting in a slope. And if you think about the way that you plant a setup, most of the time you're putting the plants near the back or the, the background plants, at least the larger ones in the back. They're going to need a little bit more substrate than the moss. You, I mean, the moss doesn't need any substrate really, but the moss and things you put up front. So it's it makes an ideal medium for the plants but it also creates depth within the enclosure mm -hmm. and i would say with that you could also use hardscape elements to create so if you make you make that uh the slope you could stick a piece of cork bark in and then build the substrate up behind it higher than what's in the front so mm, you right, create right, depth right. like that as well mm, interesting so as far as plants go, I know you have a, you use a ton of different plants, but maybe we could just quickly cover some of the larger plants. That you, we'll start with the larger ones, the ones that you have to prune because you know they're going to grow at the top of the screen. Which ones do you prefer to, to put into a tropical viv? I guess it, it depends on the animals, of course. But if we're using hypothetically something like a dart frog, that's really not going to mess up any plant at all. I guess the biggest plant I would probably use, aside from like you saw that giant vivarium I made, Mm -hmm. that i yeah. could stand in so like something yeah. like that i could put peace lilies in it or huge plants like that and not really have much of an issue but probably pothos is the largest i would do for a regular size enclosure yeah and those they don't die which is great yeah <laughs> they just go on forever the thing what about, oh go the ahead thing that's cool with them is if you have them in a very humid environment the, the leaves can get like huge huge yeah yes. it's really cool yeah, I have a, I have one in my my day gecko enclosure, and it's right under a, a jungle dawn LED, and I cannot believe they're like six seven inches across. These leaves are huge, and I also have them in my the pond that I have my rainbow boy in, and yeah. they just root out into the water, so it creates this sort of like hidden you know area, which is really cool. Yeah, and then for for larger plants, like uh, do you use ficus or what are you using there for like branching plants? Um. Honestly, I just use wood. I use driftwood or things okay. for branches. And so I know, I think it was Mr. Vivarium you were asking him and he, he said about the, I forget what, that creeping plant. I can't remember what, the creeping. Yeah, he, he was, it was a ficus, like the, uh, now I'm forgetting it as well, but the, the strangler fig. Yeah, that's what it yeah. was. So yeah. he was talking about doing, which I think could be pretty sweet. But for me, I tend to just, I'll do it with the hardscape and then find like I would get a ficus pumula, for example, and have that vine over top of the branch. So it's kind of a a pseudo a pseudo look of a branched plant, if that yeah. makes sense. Which is way easier because it's not going to grow <laughs> through the screen. Yeah. And then as, as far as mosses go, you have some great videos about mosses and how to collect moss. Is, is there any tips you can go moss wise? Because it, it seems like it's actually hard. It's easier to find than it is to, to, to go buy somewhere. Yeah. So it's tough because apparently moss is hard. I get comments, how do you keep your moss alive? It's like, I don't know. It just works. I don't know <laughs> if it's my water. I don't know if it's the lights I'm using. It just, I, I mean, I tell people what I do and it works, but it's tough. So as far as finding stuff, your best bet is to go near a, a creek or stream, somewhere where it's already wet and find the mosses that are growing there because they're most likely to adapt really well to your enclosure. So I'm sure you've seen in, um, areas where there's leaf litter or whatever you might move it and there's some stuff under there it typically doesn't work as well and sometimes it can adjust but it just definitely the, the success rate isn't as high so i found if you go somewhere that's wet or humid already you get moss from there it's already acclim acclimated that type of environment you're going to be likely to have success with it but i see people doing it a lot you don't want to just take something from outside and stick it in your tank your animals they don't know how to handle those types of things so you got to uh treat it beforehand yeah yeah or just grow it out and then use the fresh stuff and yeah then add that in i so, i prefer to do that actually because and then you always have some on hand yeah exactly so you had mentioned that giant viv that you just built and i, I was going to ask some questions about this because it is maybe you could run through the di dimensions because it's massive <laughs> yeah so the the way that it stands it's on casters so that so i can actually move it quite easily um so from floor to ceiling it's about I don't know, 87 inches, I think. But the interior space of the tank is 78 inches tall, 72 inches wide, and 24 from front to back. Wow. So the, the usable space of the tank is, I think it's 585 gallons. 
and then the with the canopy and everything it's like 650 yeah it is it is massive so as far as those casters go what, what's the weight rating on each of those because i always i think that'd be a great idea but then i always think like you got to make sure yeah. you have enough <laughs> so yeah i think if i recall correctly they're all 75 or 80 pounds each and i believe that i have 14 of them maybe oh, okay so you, you got lots yeah you, so when you see it in the video you see the underside of it i had these big casters on it which could hold like 250 pounds each but i actually couldn't fit the tank in my room with those so <laughs> i had to flip it over take those off and put smaller ones on it but i had to use way more of them to compensate for that weight but it's it's not going to be that heavy of a tank like right now it looks like it's probably really heavy it's not it might weigh like 300 pounds right and, and do you have do you know what you're gonna do with it yet yeah so i won't say too much just because i don't really like to talk about stuff too much in advance but sure that's gonna be in my mind that's the vivarium that i've always wanted so it's just gonna be extremely detailed and it's probably gonna take me like two months to build and everybody thinks oh you have a big tank you got to get something big for it not in this one we could talk right. about it more off camera, but that's all I'll say about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, that's a great uh, preview. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I have some other questions about it that shouldn't give it give it away. As far as uh, substrate, how deep are you going to go there? So in the front, the substrate will probably be about five inches deep. Okay. And then in the back, it might be like a foot. Okay, so not, not a huge depth of substrate. Nah. <clears throat> how much did that glass cost you? It must have been a lot. <laughs> Man, well, I have the receipt right here, so I can <laughs> yeah. tell you exactly. Uh, as soon so, as I saw you carrying that out, because I had ordered tempered glass for yeah, a couple man. of enclosures years ago, and it was not cheap. And those are huge pieces. So all in all, it probably cost me about $100 to build the entire enclosure, which is cheap. Because yeah. half, half the materials I got for free off of a freight shipment, and I always try to reuse stuff. But the glass cost 350 bucks. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's actually not that bad. I mean, in Canada, that probably would have been a little bit more, but, but that's not too bad. But, and they're nice pieces of glass. Yeah, and and think about this. So that's a respect six hundred gallon enclosure, respectively, and it probably cost me it cost me less than five hundred bucks to build. Yeah, that's that nothing. that's a steal. Yeah, that's awesome. So I have a question about a drainage layer. This is one of my patrons was asking about drainage because you know, I think there's sort of two schools of thought here that some people say you should leave a little bit of water in there to maintain a bacterial culture. And some people say you can just let it dry out and drain. Do you have a, an opinion on that? And Yeah. So I found that enclosures, so metolomat, for example, I found that if you use that exclusively for a false bottom, it can work, but it doesn't seem like the tank thrives as much. And I believe that it has something to do with the bacterial colonies. And so I have a pretty extensive background in fish, so I understand how important it is to have the beneficial bacteria and stuff. So I think that anything that you could have in the drainage layer that's really porous, so lava rock, even possibly sand, uh, the leka, the expanded clay pellets. I, I know that they've been used for so long, but I actually think they're probably one of the best things to use because they're very porous and they can let all that bacteria in. And so with all my enclosures now, I drill them with a bulkhead. And so that leaves about, you know, a half an inch to where the water could fill up. So I think that if there is just a tiny, you know, a tiny layer that's not becoming stagnant because it's, it's so minute, that it's actually probably beneficial. Plus the springtails are more like, they're more likely to thrive and reproduce if they have that water. At least yeah, that's yeah. what I've seen. Because the bulkhead is right on the bottom, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah. So just the, the water fills up until it hits the rim of the bulkhead. So you have like a quarter inch or whatever it is. Yeah. And I know it can be scary to drill glass and do that sort of, it's super easy. I don't know if you've ever done it, but it's super yeah. easy. I've done it a few times and every time I think I'm going to mess it up and then it just, <laughs> and, and you can buy like the cheapest diamond coated drill bits yeah. off of Amazon and they just cut right through. No yeah. problem. Yeah. 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 So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing, seeing that piece together as uh, the, the other question I have for you is sealing the wood. So I know that on the inside, people can go watch how you use like liquid rubber or pond shield, I think. So you don't have yeah. to, ask, to talk about that, but I'm curious about the external side because that's something that people are always worried about. They don't want to use things that are going to be toxic to their animals. So what are you doing to stain the wood and make it look so good? Yeah. So, I mean, the stain, it doesn't really matter what you could you use, just use whatever, but it's, if you think about it, I stained it and then I coated it in polyurethane. Polyurethane, nine times out of 10 is inert once it's cured, so it's not really gonna cause too many issues. And do you use a water-based so, polyurethane? Yeah, I do. Okay, yeah. 
So you you put the stain on. The stain, you know, if you just had that, it it probably could cause problems. But uh, put that on and then just cover it in a couple layers of polyurethane and you should be good. I, I know it's like probably not as elaborate as people would like to think, but I've never had any issues with it and that's what I've always done. So, Yeah, I think people always get a little bit scared of, of the, the chemicals and whatnot as long as things cure. Because I saw a thread a couple of months ago about dry lock. People were like, you shouldn't use dry lock. They're like, we asked the company and the company said, don't use it for frogs. And it's like, well, of yeah. course they would say that because they're, they're not going to open themselves up to liability for cr- frog keepers, you know? Well, but yeah. As long uh, as it's and- cured. Right, and you see on the back of the GE silicone, which is, I use that to build all of my tanks, never had a problem. It says, not for use with aquariums or whatever, because <laughs> yeah. they, they don't want that liability, but it's 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 100% silicone, it doesn't have anything in it, and I have tanks, I, I build my tanks with it, I seal my tanks with it, my fish, they, they thrive, they breed, they do their thing, they don't have any physical you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so i I would say a lot of it just comes from the company doesn't want that liability exactly have you seen troy's rain system that he's putting together for that big is is i I saw um his post about it on on the instagram but i didn't i didn't watch his video about it yet it's really cool so you got to go check it out but i'm wondering if that is something that you would ever try is is replicating rain just you know it's so different than misting and having this rainfall is is really yeah. really cool it looks amazing so i made a rainfall terrarium a couple months back okay. and it it kind of did that where so i had like a reservoir that filled up in the tall the top and it kind of came down like that but honestly i I try to keep things simple in my enclosures and although I think that's something that could look cool and that sort of thing, I'm not really too crazy about the fog. I'm not really too crazy about the, the raining stuff or, you know, all that kind of stuff. I like to just really focus on how the enclosure looks and I feel like all that stuff at the end of the day is just kind of like bells and whistles. Mm-hmm. And no slight to Troy, I think it's a cool idea and like, you know what I mean? Explore, yeah. explore to no end. Like I never want to deter anyone's creativity or whatever, but for me, I just... I just kind of like looking in the enclosure and I don't really need fog or rain or, or whatever. Yeah, the fog is interesting because, you know, it looks pretty cool and I can, it, it does get way overused. And I, I, you know, I warn people all the time is you don't want it to look like a disco inside the enclosure with, you know, just <laughs> fogged it up. Like the, the, the animals have to breathe in there. And there's a lot of times the fogging should be done at night when you can't even appreciate how cool it looks. But that's when the humidity rises in nature. And that's when you want to be using the fog. Yeah. If you're like me and you live in a climate that's incredibly dry, it has a sort of a, a you know, a utility. But yeah, you see people just pumping it into an exoterra and it just like fills up and the animal must be just like what the hell's going on here yeah so, you know there's aspects to that i mean yeah i don't know it, it like you said it does look cool but i just i don't know it's not my cup of tea that's just yeah. me personally though i don't know if you like it whatever so the other side obviously you have the the reptiles that you you do but then you have fish and do you see i think we kind of touched on this earlier but i i do often compare the two hobbies and you, you'd kind of mentioned that aquascaping has been around for a lot longer and it seems like reptiles are starting to catch up but do you see do you think rep the reptile trade or rep the herpticulture we can call it is going to be where aquaculture is or, or aquarium culture is in the next few years as far as just the the, the focus on scaping and, and care and whatnot you know it's tough to say because I, I was in Petco the other day and I saw that they were selling springtails and I saw that they had isopods and leaf litter and different things like that. But I honestly think that a lot of the stuff that's sold in these box stores is very low quality. Like I looked at the springtails. I'm like, what the heck is this? There's not even any spring. Like there's none in there. There's no <laughs> isopods in there. Or you're buying the Exoterra leaf litter and it's a bag this big for 10 bucks. Yeah, it's like, yeah. dude, just go on any of the online retailers and you'll get yourself a gallon bag for half that price and so i think that in the very long term future it probably would but i i feel like the general accessibility aside from going online which is really easy you know getting stuff online is super easy i i feel as though the general um just way to get it in the store is very primitive even still compared to fish stuff yeah you know, and I, I had someone mentioned this to me that the, the because it seems like why is that? Why is there that dis, disconnect between the two? And, and someone had said, you know, maybe it's because in the fish hobby, you don't get to physically interact with the animal. You don't get to take it out and hold it, or you at least definitely shouldn't. And with the reptiles, yeah. you, you do. So it almost, it, 
it forces you in the fish hobby to pay attention to what you're doing and recreating the environment. And that's where the fun comes in, where the reptile hobby, you could still take your bearded dragon out and put a hat on it and then put it back <laughs> in its tiled enclosure and feel like you're, you've done a good job. Yeah. So I, I think it's a twofold thing. I think it's definitely probably partially that, but I also think that it's just that by and large reptiles and amphibians, they always get lumped in with reptiles, but the, the two respectively, they're generally not as well received as fish. So when I tell people what I do, I almost never say that I do anything with reptiles. I'm just like, oh, I do stuff with fish tanks because I don't feel like having the stigma attached. Because as soon as I mention reptiles, oh, do you have snakes? Like everybody <laughs> gets like all thrown aback. Like, that. well, I have one snake. He's I, I've had him for like 14 years. He doesn't bite. He's cool. He likes to chill. He likes to watch TV. Like. You know, he's yeah. a cool dude because there's always the stigma. I th I think it just goes back to snakes by and large, but mm -hmm. there's there's always a stigma associated with it. And I guess it's somewhat bad on me to do that because I'm not showing that the, the animals like reptiles and amphibians are not weird or creepy or whatever. But if I get to know people better or I actually get to show them what i do they're like oh that's really cool and, and whatever but fish tanks for whatever reason i think they're just they're a lot more like if you tell anybody you have a fish tank they don't think you're weird yes but if, if you tell people oh i've got a crested gecko or i got a bearded dragon you're, you're instantly on their radar as some kind of freak <laughs> yeah yeah that is so true like when i i rarely give up in conversation that i keep reptiles unless somehow it comes up and even then i'll yeah. say reptiles snakes are not going to be the first thing i say because that's the exact response that you get and so yeah maybe yeah. it is reptile keepers just being a little bit more reclusive based off of how they know people are going to respond to that yeah i i think it's definitely that and also um I feel like a lot of people are very abrasive when they find out that you like people who are super like in love with their reptiles and I get it. They, they love them. They want everybody to, but they get really abrasive about it. And a lot of times you'll see those people who are trying to like force their snake on somebody yes. who's afraid of it. And it's like, no, you got to like ease, ease people into it. So it's tough. I just think that, um, per perhaps eventually it could get to that point, but it might not ever just because there's a stigma associated with these like, misunderstood yeah well and that's what i think is great about the way you keep and the, the way you promote is because you can have someone come over who's afraid of the snake but they're going to have more of a zoo experience where they can come up to your king snakes enclosure and they can look inside yeah. and they're not going to touch it which is different than you know having to open up a tub and pulling the snake out to show somebody because now they're in the same <laughs> exactly yeah yeah the snake's flying out of the tubs and you know now they're in the same you're in the same room as it were you know in your place they can look at it through glass and they they can become fascinated with it and maybe watch it eat and then maybe one day eventually watch it you know maybe you take it out and it goes on the floor whatever that yeah. scenario is it, it it allows for a much more positive experience because there is that innate fear that you know people i used to be afraid of snakes i wouldn't say it. i was always fascinated by them but i wasn't super excited to hold them because you know yeah. you have to get over that a little bit yeah i don't know it's weird and i i guess like from my perspective i try to make it to where you could get just as much enjoyment looking in it in the enclosure than you could handling it. Now mm -hmm. I, I, I socialize with my animals all the time so that they're very habituated to me. But I think that for just the average person, if the enclosure looks nice and they can see the animal doing all kinds of cool stuff in there, they they'll might get to the point where, Hey, m maybe I want to hold him. Yeah, exactly. But w would you ever get more snakes? Cause I know if speaking from someone who keeps snakes, we would love to see you have more snakes because your yeah. enclosures are amazing and it would give us some more ideas. So it's tough because they're, I'm honestly, I'm not a restrictor guy. I'm not, or a constrictor, my bad <laughs> restrictor. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not too big on them. I, I, I don't know why I'm just really drawn to colubrids. Yeah. And so I have a king snake. He's awesome. I love him. And I've had other snakes in the past that weren't successful operations for me. It's probably, I just wasn't doing things right at the time I was real young. Yeah. Uh, but I want to get a Taiwan beauty snake or a pair of them. But they need an enclosure probably about as big as that one that I just made. And I don't have space for that right now. But at some point, I'm going to have to build another one of those and get a pair friend there. Because they really like all that arboreal space yeah. and they're fairly long and stuff. So I guess it's for me that th I am I like all snakes. I would handle all snakes, interact with all of them. I'm not a... Well, I am I wouldn't go handling venomous stuff. I know that you could do it safely, but I'm just not that I'm, I'm cool to watch from a distance you yeah. know uh, but there yeah there's a couple that i want taiwan beauty snakes 
particularly uh I really like emerald tree boas or you know those the green snakes yeah but I don't know if I'd ever want to keep them just because they're pretty like <laughs> bitey <laughs> yeah bitey I, I was trying to think of a nice word but yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're they're not really because I, I really like animals that i can interact with that n- n- not even from a sense that i'm holding them but if i'm in their enclosure working around and doing stuff they're fine with my presence they're not flying all over the place yeah, and i, yeah. I could get them habituated to me so yeah i, I would say long term you could definitely expect to see a lot of snakes but probably not anytime soon yeah i think there's a lot of really cool diurnal clubers that you could keep that you would do a really good job with and and that was kind of the same way although i guess the opposite because the first snakes that i got drawn to were constrictors were boas and that's really the only snakes that i liked for a long time i I just looked at other snakes and i'm like i don't they're cool but i just don't want to keep them and then as i've learned more about them sort of opened up to wanting to keep different species but my collection is still pretty small but i think yeah if you were just to say colubrids, it still leaves you with a lot of options. And, and uh, yeah. there's some really cool diurnal species that I think would fit so well into a big planted vivarium. It would just be like wonderful to look at. Yeah, well, talk, talk to me off camera. Tell me what you think I should keep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we don't <laughs> want to give any spoilers and make people disappointed if you don't get it. But there's so many options, yeah. so we, we'll, uh, we'll talk off camera. I, th- um, I, think it's, I think it's also, too, that for me, I try to... so. At the end of the day, I keep animals that I like, whether they're common, uncommon, like uh, my Suriname toads, for example. A lot of people are petrified by them because of how they have babies. But for me, wait, well, so what's weird about that? I don't even I know what they are because I've seen them on your channel, but I don't know what they're. They're the ones that they have the holes on their back. Oh, and right. All the, all the babies come out. So people don't like, I had a video go viral on TikTok because they were all, everybody was going nuts about how they hated this toad. And it, there's some humor in it, but at the end of the day, I'm like, they're, you know, they're, they're highly intelligent from what I've seen. They're probably the smartest aquatic frogs compared to African clawed frogs and the dwarfs and stuff. They're super smart and they're really cool. But I guess what I was saying is I, I try not to have too many of the same type of animal fish, obviously, you know, fish are fish. They're pretty much, I don't want to say they're all the same, but you you have to keep them the same. But for uh, my king snake, Houdini, it's like, there's something special about only having one snake because I can, I can't interact with any of my other animals the same way that I do with him. That was kind of an outlier that I have two crested geckos and a gargoyle gecko, two of them I adopted, but essentially all three of them are the same animal, right? more or less, but you know, it, it just was kind of, I was an opportunity to where I could rehome these animals. So I did. Yeah. I, I, I told, I, I like the idea of having a bunch of different species. So when people come over, they can see different things and then it gives you the sort of variety of experience as a keeper as well. And I think that's important. Um, one, so there's a couple other things that I was going to touch on that are sort of moving away from reptiles. One, you know, we talked about this beginning with the success of your channel came from these terrariums and these closed terrariums. How, how do those things not die? <laughs> like, it's probably a stupid question or a simple question, but you have this terrarium that you plant and you seal and it, mm-hmm. these things, you have them going for like years. Yeah. The oldest one I have at this time is eight years old. Wow. My, yeah. My wife and I, we built it when, um, well, we were still dating at the time, but yeah, it, it's been around for a while now. I'm, I'm not a terrarium purist and a lot of people who are or like don't like that I do it, but I do open up my terrariums and I trim them mm. and I keep them manicured because if the, if they overgrow the space, a lot of times it will you'll have plants die off and then other ones will come back. But again, I'm looking at it from an artistic perspective and I want everything to look a certain way. So maybe once a year, once every two years, I'll open it up to trim it or whatever. But it's essentially it's the same concept as a bioactive vivarium so i have springtails in there some of them also have isopods and so as leaves die or different you know different things decay and are broken down you get the soil improvement so then it adds the nutrients to the plants and it in a way it just is it becomes its own little ecosystem that just feeds itself and a lot of people are often get like oh well how are those plants getting fresh air? How are they getting carbon dioxide or whatever? But the, when at night, when all the lights go off the plants, they put off CO2. So, 
So you, you know, can create that endless cycle. So yeah, the people basically. who are the, the purists, they don't open them at all? They just let them no, rip for, they, forever? Yeah, they're, they're like, that's not a terrarium. Once <laughs> you open it up, that's not a terrarium. And I'm like, well, whatever, man. <laughs> yeah, it is. To me, it is. I don't care. Like, yeah. if, if you got beef with it, whatever. But, I mean, I just... I, f- I feel like people, they, they get so hooked on these ideas. or it, You see Rules. with reptiles, too. Yeah, yeah they, they get so hooked on these ideas. And it's like... Dude, get out of your head. If you want a successful terrarium, for me at least, all you know, if I want my terrariums to be successful, I trim them. I'm not going to just like sit back and be like, oh, maybe it will be. And like, no, I, I want it to be. So I intervene. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. It's funny. And people have these strict rules that they want to keep. So like, we well, have this nice terrarium that's been clipped and pruned, or you have this one that's overgrown with brown plants in it. And well, yeah. one's pure, I guess. But, and it was, <laughs> Which, another, oh, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I get it. People like the idea of it. So, yeah, yeah. I, you know, if people look at it from that perspective, I don't want to deter them, but it's just like, look at it from my perspective, too. Exactly. <laughs> and that was another thing that I heard you mention that you got a little bit of hate over your bonsai tree that I think it looks pretty cool. But you had said that in the video, I think it was a, you were doing a tour that you had some comments. So were people giving you a hard time over that or? Yeah, because it's not like... A, I don't know. I was just kind of messing around. I don't, I'm not a true bones eye guy. I don't really know exactly what I'm doing and I'm just kind of messing around and people get all offended by it. But it's like, dude, I, I never said that I was an expert or what I'm just kind of, I'm seeing what I could do. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so I, I feel like you see that a lot in the reptile fish keeping hobbies or whatever. All, all these people who are more experienced or whatever, they jump in and they, they kind of like bash people who are just getting started out and it's like you gotta i don't know if if you want other people to to be successful a lot of times they just gotta learn from their own mistakes yeah do you interact on facebook at all or are you pretty much no. completely yeah, i, you're, you're I don't go on facebook at all yeah that's smart <laughs> yeah i've had a few run-ins in the last year or so on facebook and i just think why why am i doing this like what is this making anything better or is this just making it more annoying my life more annoying and it's, yeah. it's funny where you th- people think okay you, you know you have a youtube channel you got to share it on facebook you got to be interacting and you don't do that at all and you, you don't have to interact with like these people like you're saying who are completely stubborn who are unwilling to change with new ideas and you don't have to go yeah. through the stress of it yeah i mean i've said stuff sometimes but i honestly for my own well-being and stuff a lot of times i gotta just post and ghost like put it up and just don't even say anything and I did it up until 120,000 subscribers. I replied to every single comment Mm -hmm. and like made sure that I did. And I wish that I still did to this day, but honestly, I just don't have the time at the scale that everything is. And I think that it's good for my, my mental well being as well. Cause I'm not getting an inflated perspective of everybody saying that I'm so good or whatever, or I'll read through 120 good comments and then I'll see one that's bad and then I just feel like crap for the rest of the day. <laughs> yes, yeah. That's amazing that you actually, you know, you're responding because I try to, I respond to probably 99.9% and for the most part it's manageable but sometimes you'll have a video get tons of comments and then that's like, you know, a few hours of responding and it's exhausting too. So it's yeah. amazing that you held that up up to that, that large of a subscriber number. Yeah, and it was also tough because a lot of times it leads to ongoing conversations, which yes. I think is cool. Like, I, I, I want to interact with the audience and teach people, and if people have really specific questions in the comments that I could help them with. But eventually, you end up forgetting to respond after a certain point or whatever, and then they uh, they get upset with you or... I don't know. It's tough. Yeah, it, it is tough. And I know exactly what you mean. You read a negative comment and then there's your rest of your day is just thinking about that. So it's sometimes better to just, you know, separate yourself a little bit from it. Yeah. And I don't even know. Sometimes I'm like, I don't even know why I'm getting upset by this because I tell myself <laughs> worse things about myself in my head than what these people are saying about me. Yeah. But like, I can say that to myself, but you can't say it to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's just, I don't know. A lot of people, they come at it from a perspective and it's like, you don't know what I have to do to, to be where I am today. Mm-hmm. So it's just, I don't know. Got to walk in somebody else's shoes, I think sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And so you're at around seven, what is it? 750 or what, where are you at? Right no, now? You're eight, over 8, 800 now. Yeah. 810. So you will hit, you should hit a million this year. I don't know. We'll see. How do you I feel thought, about that? Uh, it's a little bit surreal. I mean, yeah. it's, it's cool. I, 
I used to be really into that, like, oh, yeah, like, it's validation that I'm doing something right or whatever, but, I mean, it would be cool to have the plaque up on my wall. I was just telling uh, Diane Reptiliatus, because he just got to 100K, I told him, I was like, put that plaque somewhere where you can see it so that you could look at it all the time, because whenever you're thinking, what am I doing? Why am I even bothering making these videos or whatever? You look at that plaque and think, like, that's why, like, I'm making a difference in somebody's life through putting out this content so i guess for me you know it's it's surreal i never thought i i was like once i got to a hundred thousand i thought to myself "Eh, my channel will max out around 400k i think and so now i don't have any expectations i wouldn't be surprised if someday i got to 10 million i don't think it will happen personally but if it did i wouldn't be surprised i just i feel like since i've had success on youtube i have a lot more um confidence in what i can do as an individual but also i tend to think that if you put concentrated effort into something you'll see results yeah and i think the biggest thing is the consistency you know you don't miss a video for three years and you're gonna you're gonna grow pretty much no matter what is and your your quality is gonna go up and and this is something that i was talking to somebody else with on a podcast that i was on and you know discussing the audience because obviously the audience plays a huge role you love your audience and I love my audience and, and you know, yeah. have some great followers. But at the same time, there's this sort of thing that I think I have to do where I separate myself from what they necessarily might want. And yeah. you, you want to be a little bit of an innovator when it comes to content. Because if you just fall into exactly what they want, you may just end up in this sort of rat race of, because, and also, you know, some people don't even comment on videos. So who knows <laughs> yeah. what advice you're getting from, you're getting from like a small subset. Do you kind of have that same feeling? Yeah. So it's tough. And I've talked about it a couple of times and I feel like whenever I describe it, sometimes it comes across as me being cocky yes, or yeah. something like that. And, and I don't mean it that way at all. And it's also not coming from a place of being unappreciative of the viewers or anything like that, because it, you know, if they weren't watching, I wouldn't be able to do this, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you'll get 20 comments saying, do an update video, do an update video, do this or do that. And I, I, I have responded to those things over time and done the videos that they requested. And then it ends up being my worst video ever. Like (laughs) one, one of my, one of my, the most requested video I ever had was to talk about my terrarium toolbox to this day it is my worst performing video (laughs) but it was my most requested yeah and i liked the video i had fun doing it but whenever you see people commenting they're not the majority they even though you see a lot of people saying it most of the time it's not the majority and sometimes you could get good uh recommendations or whatever if if you see it and you you could kind of feel it out. You're like, eh, I think this will do well. This won't do well. At the end of the day, you got to put out the content that you find enjoyable, that you want to make. And unfortunately, a lot of it also is you have to put out the content that will perform. That's why you see people doing all these wacky thumbnails and yeah. s- stupid stuff like that. I try to keep it at a bare minimum. And I even cringe putting like, like you know, <laughs> yeah. one of these things in my thumbnail. But sometimes you got to do it just to get people to click on it and... Uh, I've only done because people will say, oh, that's clickbait. Clickbait is you put something different in the title than what's in the video. I only did that once and I've done like entice bait or whatever you want to call it, maybe like five times. Yeah. But I digress. Really, you just got to put out what, what you want to see, because if people see that you're passionate about it, they'll they'll like it. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that you alluded to earlier was that, you know, you started realizing people are there for you and they want to see what you're up to. And yeah, I, I, and I would sort of ran into the same thing. It's like you don't want to say, oh, the audience doesn't matter because they matter the most because without the yeah, audience, then you're just sort of making videos for yourself, which would be pointless. But mm-hmm. you don't want them to necessarily drive the ship because yeah. they could take you into the ditch by accident without, you know, because who, who knows who you're listening to. So it's sort of a, a catch 22 in a lot of ways. It, it's, yeah, for it, sure. And, and yeah, what, what video was it that you think you used clickbait on and, and what happened? It was, I did an update on, I don't know if you saw, it's like a, a ecosphere I did where it's a tree, but it uses the Marimo moss balls yes, to make yeah. it look like a tree. It was like, what happened to this or what and i made the water look like it was brown (laughs) and like whatever but i i thought to myself because historically updates do really bad on my channel that's why i don't really do them that much because people don't want to watch them and it's not that 
it's not that my enclosures look like crap or I or that I'm hiding something or whatever. It's just like I, I at the end of the day, now I have to make a living doing this. And yeah. it's it's not like I'm looking at it from a greedy perspective, but I, I have to provide for my family. I have to provide for my animals and I, I need to do what's going to be best for the longevity of the channel. So I I try to keep that stuff at a minimum, though, because it's i don't know i think it's lame yeah yeah I, I, same with me i just try to keep it as like you said entice bait is a lot better than clickbait because you know people yeah. do get kind of you know upset about clickbait and this is not what i saw um one thing that i would love to tackle one day myself i, I don't have any fish yet i live in an apartment i've had a par- fish in my apartment before tank leaked it was a whole thing so it's been years mm-hmm. since i've kept fish but when i'm in a house that will be my goal but i, I would love to do a blackwater aquarium because i love blackwater aquariums i think many people don't but i think they look so cool my wife doesn't like them so maybe we'll have to do two i don't know but what what are some tips with with blackwater so blackwater is probably one of my favorites as well i think it's really cool you see different behaviors from the fish so uh i don't know if you can really you probably can't really see it in the video but i have uh silver dollars do you you know what those are Yeah, yeah yeah so they're typically a pretty skittish fish they're flighty and if you walk up to the tank too fast they kind of (laughs) fly all over the place and you'll see that with a lot of different fish but as soon as you have those tannins in the water they can't see you as well because the water is tinted and so they they'll exhibit behaviors and act in ways that you wouldn't really see in a tank otherwise that are at the end of the day more natural because that's they're coming what fish do you see aside from a couple examples coming from clear water exactly. most of the time you can't even see in it yeah yeah so that that's what the fish like and it's just i don't know for me there's a certain beauty about it i i uh i like seeing the leaves decaying and w- once they're all like eaten down and all that you have left is just kind of the veins because that's the last part to go it, it looks really cool and in a way it's because I would say a lot of times aquariums are more static than a vivarium could be in that it doesn't change as much like I was describing because you don't have those same decomposition cycles. But your blackwater aquarium from day one to day 1000, it's going to look different Mm -hmm. the entire time because stuff's breaking down and... I don't know. I, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, they're, they are. Uh, I can see why people don't like them because they probably come over and they're like, why is your fish tank brown? But, yeah. I, I mean, hopefully people understand it when they see it, that it looks like a slice of the river, which is exactly where these animals are coming from. And I think it looks m- so much more natural than a crystal clear aquarium. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, though. I like seeing a clear aquarium as well. Yeah, that's what you got to do. Maybe you got to do both. Um it- a lot of that, I don't, I mean, you said you haven't been in the aquarium hobby for, or well, you had cichlids, right? I had cichlids, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so they, they, you know, that's typically clear water and everything. But when I started in the aquarium hobby, I was 14, so that was 14 years ago. Tannins were like the enemy. Yes, you, yeah. You better, you better put carbon and carbon on top of carbon in your tank to get rid of tannins. And boil your the driftwood enemy. for eight days. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I think a lot of the, at least within the aquarium hobby, not with regular people, I think a lot of the tannin hate just comes back from how how it used to be perceived. Yeah, yeah. Before I had cichlids, I had just a tropical community, and I remember getting this piece of driftwood from somewhere, and yeah, I put it in, and then it was like tea the next day. And I'm like, oh, what the hell? And I remember boiling this thing for like days. Like my apartment was like humid, the windows were all fogged yeah. up, and my mom's like, "How long are you gonna boil that stick for?" But I could never get the tannins out. It would have been like months probably of just soaking it. So yeah, I think it's a cool dimension to add. So maybe in the future, that's what I'll do. Obviously not with with cichlids or or African cichlids, but. You know, yeah, I mean, you could else. do a, a pistos or something like that. Yeah, it's yeah. it's funny because I uh, I always boil my leaves and stuff before I put them in tanks so they sink and all that kind of stuff. And I'll I'll sneak it upstairs, start boiling it or whatever, and then I'll be down here working and I'll hear my wife upstairs. She's like, "Oh, he's doing it again!" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> boiling it because she she doesn't like the smell. And I'm like, "That's yeah. a good smell. I like that." I know that's what I say too. It smells like the woods. Like I like yeah. when I go boil leaves. And I was doing that. I always do it in the fall. I'll go collect a whole bunch of just for for you know the vivariums just to have a leaf litter. And yeah, I always either cook, put it in the oven, or or boil it. And yeah, she always gets annoyed at the smell. But last year was the year before. Uh, a big spider came in with with all the leaves and scurrying around on the floor. So, you know, the wives have to be very, you know, patient with us. Yeah. 
it's <laughs> what's well, it's yeah for sure it's a little bit different with me because like i had all this stuff before my wife and i were even dating so mm-hmm. it's always been around so she just kind of accepts that it's the way that it is and she even does encourage me to like get more animals sometimes and do stuff like that but she's not in the hobby but yeah you know i always pride myself on that like you'll see the memes and stuff like i do ask my wife if i could get this or like uh, sneaking snakes in or whatever but like i am always like my wife's like you know just do your thing like she encourages me to do it so it's if you can find somebody that compliments you in that way it's really a helpful helpful yeah. thing Oh yeah, my wife is the same. She's not involved in the hobby at all. She's kind of fascinated by them, a little bit scared of, of the animals, but she's like likes to look at them. But yeah, same thing. It would be like if I said I want to get another animal, she'd say go for it. It would never be, you know, she would never stomp on that part of the hobby. So I think you're right. It, that's a huge part. And that's something where people get trapped in a lot of the time. I think they have a huge collection and then it becomes like them, their family versus their collection, which yeah. is really a nightmare to be in. Yeah, I've never been there, but... I, I could imagine. And it's yeah. a shame because I, I think that it's it's probably a give and take on both sides. Like maybe they're spending too much with, time with their collection and not with the, the family or, or whatever. But yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, you got to balance it for sure. Well, Tanner, this was a great conversation. We've covered a lot of things here. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to mention before we jump off? Uh, well, I know it's... And I, I'm not a scientist. I will never be one it's just not <laughs> i'm an artist that's just who i am but I, I know that a lot of stuff that you talk about on here is a- animal behaviors and mm-hmm. things like that and i feel aside from the fact that i always sort of encourage people to make the best enclosures they possibly can or whatever in order to do that a lot of it comes with uh understanding your animals and something that i've i've been saying recently that i i honestly believe it to be true all the scientists out there could say that I'm an idiot or whatever. That's fine. But I think that all animals tend to be sort of like dog breeds, for example. So like you have dog breeds that are bred and they all, so like all golden retrievers, for example, have these specific traits and all pugs, they, they have these specific traits, but they're all individuals based on how they were raised. So all ball pythons, for example, they're going to retain the same traits across the line but they're all going to be slightly different based on how they were raised. So what works for your ball python might not necessarily work for that guy's ball python because maybe yours likes to climb, maybe his doesn't for whatever reason. And so I, I think that it, it can become sort of subjective on how you care for your animals. Obviously, there's standards and certain things, but I, I do think that it is somewhat subjective based on your animals. And I notice even with my crested geckos, the one I adopted – he's he likes to be handled more than the other ones but he's also more flighty than the other ones it's it's just like they're very different because the the one i got from a breeder i bred her from point a to now and she's very chill she just kind of likes to do her own thing and he's more flighty and whatever i don't know what he was through before I had him and then the other one the gargoyle gecko i can't handle her at all i've i've yeah. tried to habituate her and she's for six years she just was kind of thrown in a tank and not really shown any love or whatever and i also so i recently put a mist king on those vivariums because i thought oh yeah it will help me out or whatever probably about a week and a half in i was seeing that all three of the geckos were becoming scared of me because i wasn't in the tanks every day spraying down Mm -hmm. the tanks and stuff so i think that to get the best results understand your animals see what their habits are, see what they like to use, what they don't like to use, tweak the enclosures based on that, and spend as much time as you possibly can with them, not to the point of stressing the animals out, obviously, and if if you understand your animals, you'll know what that looks like, but spend as much time as you possibly can with them so that they know you're not going to hurt them. Yeah, I think that is extremely well said. They're, of course, like what you're saying, they're sort of species typical things that you're going to see but there's so much individual variability in each animal and Mm -hmm. the only way to uncrack those nuts is by being the keeper and interacting with the animal and observing the animal you have to learn that animal what it likes what it doesn't because like you said everyone is going to be a little bit different and if you're not engaged in that creative process like we talked about earlier you're going to miss out on all those things and you might be missing out on a whole bunch of behaviors or a whole bunch of added welfare that the animal could have sure if you just ignore it yeah 
yeah, I think that's a that's a fantastic <laughs> way to wrap up. I think we hit everything. Tanner, can you let everybody know where you can be found? I think most people will know, but you can drop whatever yeah. you want there. Uh, YouTube, you can find me under Serpa Design and Tanner Serpa. I did a second channel recently where I post whatever I want and also do like long form shots of static shots of the tank. So if you just want to watch one of my aquariums or whatever, you can check me out there. Uh, Serpa Design on Instagram and Serpa Design on TikTok. And yeah, you just search me up, you can find me. I'm not on Facebook and but, uh, I'm not on Twitter either. Well, I think the other places are, are perfect to be able to follow along with your journey. So thank you so much, Tanner. This was a great conversation. So thanks for joining me. Of course. Me. Thanks for having me. Okay, that is the end of that episode. Tanner, thank you so much for joining me. Also, thank you for listening to the podcast. I know that you were already listening to the show before I reached out to you. Uh, so I appreciate that. And I also appreciate you spending the hour and a half with me here. And thank you very much to the many members of the Serpa Squad who are probably listening to this right now. I really appreciate you coming to check out the podcast. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Tanner. And I also hope you go check out a few other episodes of the Animals at Home podcast. And thank you to my regular listeners. As always, I very much appreciate your support. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure you give it a share on Instagram or Facebook. And if you want to do the extra step, head to the Apple Podcasting app and give the show a five-star rating or write a review. Again, if you'd like behind-the-scenes access as well as early access to episodes, make sure you head to patreon.com slash animals at home and join us there. And thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring the episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description as well as the show notes. Show notes are found at animalsathomenetwork.com. That is it for me, guys. Thank you very much for listening. I will talk to you next week.